So the Yale Photogrammer project started approximately at this point about three years ago um, when Lauren Tilton, uh, who, who's a graduate student in the American Studies Department, uh, was working on a project where she was using photographs from the FSA OWI collection, which is a, a collection of 165,000 photographs that were taken by the U.S. government between 1935 and 1945. Um, and because they were taken by the federal government, they're amazingly open source. And because they're housed at the Library of Congress, which is awesome, they digitized them all. And so you can go online and see all 165,000 images and all of the metadata that's also attached to them. So which, what's really great is that since these were all made at the same time by the same group, there are a lot of pieces of metadata that like, basically when you're, when you're trying to apply something such as Dublin Core to all the paintings in the Louvre or something, you know, there, there are naturally going to be pieces of metadata that are specific to certain paintings and not specific to others. What's great about this collection is there are things such as uh, something called a lot number, which is the assignment that a photographer was on. Um, there's a certain classification, hierarchical classification system, which I'll show you a, vi a visualization of. So what's really great about this collection is that it has fantastic metadata. It's all digitized and it's all open source. Uh, what wasn't fantastic about it, at least when Lauren was working on it, is that the only way to explore the collection is to go onto the Library of Congress website and just search for things. There's a Google, you know, Google style search for something and you can type in cows and you'll see pictures of cows, pictures of cheese if you want to see them. If you know a photographer or a place, you can type those all in. And that's really great if your research concerns uh, one specific location or one specific type of photo or and sometimes um, like migrant mother if you're familiar with that one is in this collection sometimes people are interested in one specific photo and that's great um, but Lauren uh, studies more like representation of like race and ethnicity and she was interested in how the collection as a whole was actually characterizing race in the, in the United States during the Great Depression and World War II and for her it wasn't enough to look at the individual uh, photos she was actually interested in the whole collection and, and what was the collection, as sort of looking at patterns and things, what the collection was showing her. Um, and so as a statistician, um, she was showing me this and I'm thinking open data and I can download it and there's, there's a lot of it and I was just like giddy. Um, and so the project sort of came from that and, and we downloaded it and started playing around with it and making visualizations. Um, and as we did that, it was just, there were more deep questions and, and more exciting things that we learned about it. Um, and so from that point, uh, we actually started developing a team, and I think that's the theme I've been hearing uh, at this, this, whole, uh, this whole day is that you know, digital humanities is all about a team. Um, and so we got the buy-in from Laura Wexler, who's a professor of American studies, um, and is Lauren's advisor to direct the project. Um, we had Stacy Maples, who's in the map collection here, um, Kim Penko, who was, at, who was formerly at uh, Yale, uh, in, instructional technology, um, and then Peter Leonard, when he, when he came here, um, has also joined our team. Um, and then, scrolling down, we also got, um, we, went, we actually went to the physical library of Congress and talked to the people who were curating them and asked them, you know, um, like, if you could visualize this, how would you do it, and what are things that we don't know? There were a lot of the metadata wasn't very well documented, but it was there, which was great, and we were able to work with them and, and do things that they couldn't do because they have a lot of restrictions because of, um, like ADA compliance and, and time and resources. Um, and so they were really happy to work with us and we, we won a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. Um, and so all of this came together and now we're actually at the point this fall where we have a working website. It's at uh, photogrammer.yale.edu. Um, it's sort of in its still testing phase but we're kind of a soft open so before it was behind a firewall and now you can share it and look at it and we're trying to get um, advice from people about, you know, how, what could we add, what do we have to explain a little bit better, um, uh, load testing, and all of these things before making sort of an official announcement and, and putting it out to the public at large. Um, so I thought I would just spend a little bit of time showing you a demo, sort of the way that, that we visualize people um, going through the, the website. So probably the most exciting thing is the map. Um, so this is a, a chloroplast map of all the counties in the U.S. where photographs from this collection were taken. Um, so you can see some of them are, are shaded very heavily, and that's where there are a lot of photos, and some of them are shaded more lightly. That's where there weren't quite as many. Um, not sure. Okay, so um, one thing you can do is, that the, like I said, this screen's cutting me off a little bit, but I can limit the years and only look at, say, the first year of the collection, and I can see that it was much more concentrated in the rural areas less so than the cities and 
for instance, when I go and look at the later years, when they were losing funding, um, we see they were mostly uh, in the neighborhood of DC, which was cheaper and easier to photograph. Um, and so putting the whole map back, what we've observed when we were doing using te user testing um, is that everybody's first thing they do is they try to find their hometown, which makes a lot of sense. And it's one of the exciting things about this collection is that it spans most of the US. So um, my hometown is in Brunswick, Maine, which is in, in Cumberland County. Um, so I can click on that, and I see that there are uh, 43 photos. So clicking in, I can actually see all of the photos here. Let me zoom out. Oh, there we go. Um, and so you can see that these are all the photographs that were taken and digitized in the collection, and they range from things such as like the wharf in Portland, um, which is now all restaurants, um, flooded homes in Sebago Lake, and then my favorite is the Hermit of Maine, which is this pipe smoking organist who lives all alone somewhere in Maine. Um, and so you, you can start to, people start to connect with this collection and I think that's why it's been so popular is because everybody uh, came from somewhere and if you're from the US and you're not from one of these random spots where they didn't take photographs, there are going to be photos that you know and, and places that you've seen um, you know, 70, 80 years ago and, and it's just really exciting to see that. Um, so as I was saying, there's a lot of metadata attached to this collection that that is special to this collection. So one of them that's kind of the most exciting is um, these classification tags, which is a hierarchical classification of, subject classification of the photographs in the collection. So for instance, this is categorized people as such, groups and individuals, middle-aged men. And so if we wanted to see other middle-aged men, we could click on this and see all of them. Um, our, we were one, there's also an old man and really old man, and we were wondering who decided where the cutoffs were there and how political that got. But, um, and so you can see all the photographs that are, that are stored like this. And from a metadata MLS um, side thing, this is really interesting because these are the categories that the physical prints are stored at in the Library of Congress. So now in, nowadays in computing, um, we can do like Peter does, you know, add a bunch of keywords in search and we can, we can have a photograph exist in seven different categories or a hundred different categories. But at the time, this one photograph had to go in one drawer. And so this was the categorization they actually used for it. Um, and so if instead of, so one way to drill into the collection is to start at the map and then uh, go to a specific photograph and, and see similar ones, but uh, another way of doing it is to look at the whole set of classification tags and drill down. Um, so for instance, these are the, uh, the top level categories, so we could click on uh, transportation, and then let's say we wanted uh, tourists, because I'm not really sure how that's transportation, and then, uh, so I guess there's only one subcategory in there, and then we'll see the 18 photos that are in that folder. And if you go to the Library of Congress, it's actually pretty exciting. You can go and open the right drawer and the right binder and pull them out, and you'll see, uh, presumably as long as they haven't gotten mis misorganized, these 18 photos that are in there. Um, so it's pretty interesting um, when you go there and, and put the collection um, back together with the website. But this lets you do it from anywhere instead of having to go uh, physically to DC to do it. Um, and so the last thing I'll show you, which is which has actually added a lot more context to this than I think we even realized that it would is, um, so these are chloropleth, um, and what we've, this is a chloropleth map where we've shaded each ca uh, county by how many photos there are, but another way to do it is to simply to put a dot where every, photogra where every um, photograph was taken. And it's, it's a pretty big uh, jumble, but if I can get it in here. So, uh, but what, where it really becomes interesting is I can put the 1937 Seaver map on top of it. So this is the map I'm told I wasn't alive in 1937, but I'm told that if you were driving around and you didn't have um, a GPS on your phone, you would use one of these maps and that's how you would figure out where you were going. Um, and so what's really fascinating is if we zoom in uh, to a specific part of the, the map, you can see that the photographers were actually taking these classic routes like Route 66 across the, the southwest. Um, and you can actually track photographers as they were driving down the country. Um, and it's really interesting because if we click um, here, for instance, this is Jack Delano and he's in Arizona. Um, and we see all of these photographs were taken in March of 1943. The, all of these photographs along this Route 66 were taken in March of 1943. So, what this was doing was adding new context and new ordering and new metadata that we're still trying to figure out how can we reincorporate it back into the original photographs because the, the photographs as they sit on the Library of Congress is just these are all in March of 1943 but really because we know where they were taken 
and we have that data, and we know that he went east to west because we have some notes and letters, and you can see that I think he, I think he starts in March and ends in April. Um, we know which direction he went. We actually know some latent information about the photographs. We know that, well, unless he was driving insanely and kind of popping up and down and back and forth, which he probably wasn't, he's probably going in some systematic order down the highway. And so we know something about the ordering of these photographs, and so if you're writing about how did Jack Delano view the US and you wanted to write a research paper about him, it might be really helpful to see, well, how did he, what sorts of things did he start taking photos of? What sort of things did he stop taking photos of, like at the end of his trip, and how did that change? And um, without this visualization, you wouldn't, I, I don't even know that I would have thought about that piece of it, and I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it without physically you know, getting out a map and marker and plotting them all out, which gets to be a lot when you have 165,000 photographs. Um, so those are just some examples of um, how you can go into uh, the data from our website, and we're still, as I said, um, we're still sort of testing it and playing around, but it, it's up there and we're hoping people will go and break it and give us feedback and so when it really goes live, it, everything works kind of crisply and nicely um, and we're continuing to add other visualizations on here as we play around with them.